I'm excited to uh, present here. Uh, I'm Michael Taylor. I'm a professor at University of Washington, uh, also known as UW sometimes. Uh, and this is uh, Max Rutenberg, who's uh, one of my PhD students, will be uh, presenting the second half of the talk. Uh, so the talk is entitled The Hammer Blade RISC-V uh, Miniquare. And uh, it's essentially a programmable, scalable RISC-V fabric um, that, you know, in some senses is equivalent to a GP GPU, but it's uh, uh, completely open source. So for motivation, you know, uh, especially in this room, uh, you know, we're experiencing this open source renaissance, right? We have open source ISAs, open source CAD tools, open source processors, open source uh, libraries and RTL. And so I, I think, you know, we're going to see enormous transformation in the industry because of all this open source stuff in hardware that we're doing. Um, and then at the same time, uh, we have all of these new application domains um, that are uh, enabled essentially by Moore's Law winding down. Right. So, and the key two technologies really uh, for enabling um, these domains are uh, the development of new DSLs, domain-specific languages that uh, help us make um, the specification of parallel compilation, uh, or make the, the process of compiling some application and getting it to run in parallel in some way uh, feasible, and then also the availability of uh, new parallel compute fabrics. Um, and those are the things that are going to get us the energy efficiency that we need in order to get, uh, you know, the high performance within a, a given thermal uh, envelope. So uh, the hammer blade uh, many core is kind of seeking to be the base class of these uh, parallel compute fabrics uh, that are needed for these new application domains. Uh, so what is uh, hammer blade many core? So it's a uh, highly pro programmable, uh, highly energy efficient spatial uh, fabric for uh, sort of mixed sparse dense compute. So the idea is this is trying to address not uh, just codes that would run reasonably well in a traditional GPU, but also uh, new codes like uh, graph uh, codes that are uh, much less well behaved and uh, much more challenging uh, to get uh, some parallel speed up. And at the very heart of the many cores, we have a super um, high efficiency compute tile. It's a one instruction per cycle RISC V engine. Um, and then each tile has uh, uh, an instruction cache and a local data scratch pad. And you can adjust the size of this. But generally, you want it to be small, because the smaller it is, the more cores you can fit on the chip, right? So there's a trade-off there. And we'll show you how the architecture actually allows you to uh, flexibly change that trade-off. Um, each core also has an FPU and then a little router to talk uh, to the other cores. Uh, and then it's very scalable. You just stamp out as many uh, cores uh, as you want. If you have you know, a silicon area, you just stamp them out until you fill up the area. So, um, so we have very good. Um, efficiency um, uh, for the many cores. So this is a picture of uh, a floor plan in TSMC 16 nanometer. Uh, and then this is actually a die photo from the actual chip. Um, so this was a, a chip uh, we presented at the, uh, the RISC-V uh, summit, the fourth one, I think it was in 2017. Um, and what's amazing about this core is that even with super small um, instruction uh, memory and data memory, uh, the memories themselves occupy 64% of the tile area. So it's a kind of existing proof that, yeah, you could try to go and like refactor the score and try to squeeze it down a little more, but the maximum improvement you could possibly get would be about 30, 36%. Uh, so it's uh, so small, in fact, that you can fit 40 of these uh, per millimeter in 16 nanometer, and in 7 nanometer, you'd be able to fit 120 of these per millimeter. So zooming out, you know, we have this array of cores, but we need to, we need to also integrate them into a parallel memory system. Uh, and so uh, the uh, architectural model is you have the sea of cores, and then at the edge you have these L2 victim caches that are then connected to many parallel memory channels. So it could be, for example, uh, HBM2, uh, which you know, in, in uh, GPU systems you can have 64 parallel memory channels these days. Uh, and these caches are also uh, adaptive and can... Uh, essentially change your behavior on the fly uh, as, the, uh, as you learn more and more about the workload and, and the input data set. Now, it's pretty easy to create a state of course. So the real um, special sauce is how you weave these things together. So the interesting thing about uh, how this is done in our system is that every single memory location and every single uh, local course scratch pad Every single memory location in the L2s, every single memory location in the DRAMs, it's all addressable by all the cores. So that means they can very easily collaborate just by doing loads and store instructions, uh, which will automatically get routed over uh, to the, uh, whichever core it is or, or um, uh, cache it is that owns uh, that particular location. And so a core can actually uh, 
issue uh, you know, many repeated loads and stores, those things will go out in the network in parallel and then come back potentially out of order. And uh, the core can continue uh, executing instructions. It's only when it actually tries to use uh, the register that was the, the uh, uh, result of the load instruction that it might actually stall uh, waiting for the data. So one of the concepts that we have um, in uh, trying to map software uh, to the many cores, you know, we have this big array of tiles, and now we want to sort of group them together um, uh, for two reasons. So one is we may want to execute you know, many different programs at the same time on the many core. So we have this concept of tile group. And here we show a tile group, which is a 4x4 four four tile group, where I allocated you know, these 16 tiles uh, on the many core. And uh, the many core essentially can um, the computation that's running on the many core inside the tile group can share all the collective memories of those tiles. So this is a way for you to manage not only uh, how much parallelism you have by having more or fewer cores, but also how much uh, working memory that you have. So if you have a big working set, then you can use a larger group of cores in order to increase the amount of uh, local memory that you have. And of course, because those cores are located near each other, the latency is very low in order to uh, access the data. Uh, whereas, you know, if you go off chip, the latency would be uh, higher. Uh, so in order to program this, we have, uh, of course, we have DSLs, which are more user facing. But in terms of writing, you know, very high performance uh, library code for those DSLs, we have something we call CUDA Lite, which is uh, very analogous to CUDA. And, and the idea is that, you know, there's a big developer base for CUDA that's familiar with those, uh, you know, programming constructs. And we'd like to essentially take the um, the knowledge that people have embedded in CUDA code and then relatively easily move uh, that knowledge uh, over to uh, executing on the many core. Uh, and so this is a, an example a comparison of a snippet of device code that runs on CUDA and the equivalent code on CUDA Lite. And it's, you know, it's, there's, there's, it's fairly one-to-one um, uh, -one in terms of uh, being able to move code over. There, there's certainly some differences in terms of optimization and what, what would be preferable in one architecture or the other. But in terms of getting something up and running, uh, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, so, of course, you have the many core, and these cores are highly specialized uh, for dense compute. But we would like to put a control processor of some form. So there's two flavors of this uh, in our system. So the first is we support uh, doing uh, PCIe-attached um, acceleration. So in this case, you know, we have a chip. It's a many core chip. It's on a PCIe board, and then we, put, we connect it to a Xeon server. Uh, and we have uh, this up and running on F1. So in F1's case, there's an FPGA board, which is simulating our many core. And then we have our you know, uh, host code running on the Xeon. So you have x86 code talking to the many core together. Um, in the longer term, our goal is to actually have a Black Parrot uh, integrated on the same SOC uh, as the many core. So for example, you could imagine you know, right now we, we would run PyTorch on the Xeon, and it offloads calls to the uh, PCIe board. But eventually, you know, when uh, PyTorch runs on uh, RISC V, we would be running that on uh, Black Parrot. Uh, so I'd like to mention that uh, we've actually been through many iterations. So we have a very agile methodology where we do tape outs, we build software on the devices, we get experience, and we develop the next generation. So we're actually uh, entering our fifth generation, uh, uh, an iteration of this, so the fifth silicon iteration of, of the many core. Um, and so we started out in 180 nanometer, and then we did two chips uh, in 16 nanometer that had a 511 uh, RISC V cores. So it broke the world record for RISC V performance. I should probably still hold it. Uh, and also uh, for core mark for any uh, ISA. Uh, and the latest uh, system, uh, Hammer One, is where we've really been focusing on uh, programmability improvements uh, to grow the user base and also floating point uh, support. So I'd like to mention uh, that in addition to um, the, uh, the many core itself, uh, my group has a, a website, bjump.org. We have a bunch of stuff that might be of interest to you uh, if you're developing open source hardware. So one of them is something we call Bjump STL. Uh, Dan uh, mentioned this in the last talk. So this is a, a library of very high quality implementations of almost every hardware primitive that you can think of. You want routers, you want arbiters, you want caches, you want networks, uh, you want high-speed links that go off your chip. All of these things you know, we've developed over you know, the last 10 years in our group, and we've really iterated on their um, quality and also results. And they, it's all been tape uh, validated. We also have uh, open source motherboards. 
So you can design your ASIC to a particular um, interface standard that we specified, and then you can just take uh, your ASIC and plug it into a socket, and it'll just work with this board. So you don't have to go and design a board in order to uh, uh, use the silicon that you developed. We also uh, have open source BGA packages. These are much higher pinout than you can get off the shelf. So if you um, design your chip to this interface standard that we specify, this ASIC socket standard, then you can get much more um, a higher performance bandwidth uh, out of your piece of silicon than you would uh, on your own. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up the hardware part. I wanted to uh, also mention that you know, we have uh, developed a methodology for taking cores out and replacing them with accelerators uh, in this uh, fabric. And uh, in fact, our collaborators at Cornell uh, have been developing several accelerators and have uh, you know, done proof of concept already uh, with uh, having you know, hybrid uh, many core accelerator systems. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over uh, to Max. He's going to talk about uh, uh, some of our hammer, hammer blade software specs. So yeah, so I'm going to, hi, I'm Max. I'm going to give an overview of our software stack. So one of the primary goals of Hammerblade is programmability and portability of code that already exists that's written higher level frameworks. So CUDA Lite, which is our low level programming API, is the building block for these higher level frameworks. Our collaborators at Cornell are working on PyTorch, or are back in for PyTorch for Hammerblade. Um, we at UW are also working on DGL, which is a Python library for targeting uh, crap structured data, but using machine learning techniques. And TVM, which is a machine learning IR. And we're also targeting Graphit, which is a DSL for uh, high performance graph analytics. So just a quick introduction to Graphit. Um, it's Main feature is that it decouples the, uh, the semantics of the program from the optimizations that are applied. This is important because with graph algorithms, there's a whole, the field of optimizations is pretty wide, and they don't always work on every single input. Sometimes the optimizations that work are highly reliant on the input. Um, the two main types are edge sets and vertex sets. And then there's a schedule language, which you can see down here which says what optimizations to apply. So we ported this to Hammerblade, um, and here's sort of an example. So the same snippet of code, I actually took it from BFS. Um, basically, the frontier is just being updated by uh, traversing the existing frontier, applying an update function, and then creating a new frontier from the nodes that were updated. You can see in the scheduling language that we've said that we've at, that we've said that we want the dense pole direction and that we want to generate Hammerblade code. Down here you can see the host side that is generated. So this runs on the x86 or Black Parrot. Um, you can see that it's just the outer loop, uh, but we're offloading the work. And here's the generated risk five code. Um, it's C++ code. The work is self-assigned. We have a local range function. And then we are doing a parallel dense update. Uh, and then finally, when all the work is done, we do a tile group sync. So graphs are kind of challenging because they are typically memory intensive. Uh, so taking full advantage of all your cores can be tricky. You might spending, they might spend a lot of time waiting for memory. So one way you might be able to fix this, address this problem on Hammerblade is doing something similar to what we might do on GPUs. We can tile our memory accesses. So in this case, what we, the proposed plan would be to take vertex data and uh, block and, keep, and access it in a block faction, uh, fashion. So we would pull it in all in one block for a group of tiles. 
and they would pull it into their local memory. And then they could just do sparse updates from the, from the edges. So they can access the edges. You would keep them, you would keep the edges partitioned across DRAM channels. This would maximize your message transfer rate. And then you could restrict your updates to a given range. So this would keep your locale, this would um, keep you from breaking your cache and it will reduce the amount of time you spend waiting around for memory. And it will maximize the parallelism of your course. So now I've given you an overview of mapping an application to Hammerblade. I want to uh, onboard you all with how you can get involved. So our main simulating environment is a C, a C, C++ co-simulation environment. It allows you to, uh, to simulate your entire stack, the host software, the mini core software. We use Synopsys as our RTL simulator. Um, I should note that most of the code in our, the RTL in our group is very later friendly. So it would be a straightforward and solid contribution to get very later working. Uh, the code's all up on GitHub. You clone this repository called Blade Runner. You get the related sub-projects. And then there are instructions in the README about how to get up and running. If you have the tools and the environment, it's fairly straightforward. We also support deployment on AWS. Uh, you need the Vivado tools. You need Xilinx Vivado compiler. Um, but it's all part of the same project. And we have uh, instruct, detailed instructions in the readme about how you can build the FPGA image, how you can build the machine image, and you can get up and running. And the machine image will have everything. It'll have runtime libraries, development tools for RISC V, the FPGA bit image, all of it. And uh, lastly, I'd like to suggest some directions you could take to help us contribute to the to Hammerblade software stack. Um, all of our software frameworks that we've ported are works in progress, everything down to CUDA light. But there's some other really interesting directions we could take that we haven't explored yet. So Halide is for uh, image processing. We haven't uh, looked at that yet, but we're pretty confident that would be a good fit. Um, TensorFlow, right now we have PyTorch, but TensorFlow would also be excellent. Um, FFTW is a library for uh, uh, doing FFTs on CPUs. Uh, where there's also QFFT for CUDA. We would really love one for the Hammerblade Mini Core as well. Um, on top of that, Cornell has been working on building their own accelerators and, as and adding them to the our mesh. And it would be great if you could add for people to add their own accelerators in to expand our, uh, our application domains. So we have a full stack team, and they work very, very hard on this project. And I'd like to thank them before concluding. And on behalf of the Hammerblade team, we salute you all. We really hope you contribute. And thank you very much. Oh, so the question was, oh, ha how, um, how many of these can you fit on FPGA? Um, so so we, we haven't done too much with small FPGAs, but we can fit 192 cores on a big FPGA. So a reasonable number of cores would fit on a small FPGA. Uh, 